Welcome to VikeFans.com and the Legends of the Longship series. I'm Tom Moore, and joining me today is Super Bowl champion and former Minnesota Vikings center, Matt Burke. Matt, thanks for joining us today. It's great to have you here. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Tom. I got to tell you, Matt, I'm a little out of sorts this off season because in years past, when I'd put on my annual winter weight, my wife would say to me, "Hey, hon, you might want to cut back a little bit at dinner." And I would always reply with, "Yeah, but I weigh less than Matt Burke." And now, Matt, you've, ah. you've lost about 70 pounds in a rip. What gives with the rapid weight loss? You're killing us guys with the expectations from our wives. You know, I think uh, everybody struggles when they retire in some way, and my struggle manifested itself with the kick-ass fitness regimen. I I, I I just hated my lifestyle. I've been been working hard to keep that weight on for a long time. For me, I was fortunate that it was work for me to put it on. So when I got done playing, I I was looking forward to the opportunity of just dropping it and just kind of made a made a little game out of it, challenged myself and said, How low can I go? Now I think the picture that you may be referring to it's really not a sustainable state for me. So I mean that was fun to do that and get that low, but I'll never be that shredded again. I'm I'm that guy. He doesn't really exist. I'm about twenty pounds heavier and and that's a good weight for me. So what we take from that answer is we can now tell our wives, hey Matt told us it's okay to put on twenty pounds. Is that right? So you take your all-time best and add 20 pounds, that's where you should be. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, after a 15-year NFL career, you retired as a Super Bowl champion, but you really never left the NFL as you now work as a league appeals officer. And, Matt, can you tell us what you do in your role with the NFL? The fines that take place, the conduct on the field, the it's fine, and the NFL passes out the fines. There's a process that players can go through and, and file an appeal. And I'm one of two appeals judges. We hear all the cases independently, so we don't confer, collaborate on any decisions. But uh, sometimes they're fine. Sometimes there's actual suspensions. And it's important work right now with the, the culture change that's gone on in the NFL, especially with the, the concussion talk and, and making the game safer and protecting defenseless players. I feel like it's a pretty important role and, and one that I'm, that I'm honored to, to serve in to try to help uphold these new rules and kind of this new way of playing football. Well, it sounds like you've been pretty busy with that, but you also had the time in your first off season to write a new book, which is titled All Pro Wisdom, The Seven Choices That Lead to Greatness. Now, when I read the book, I learned that this is not really a biography or a sports book. It really rather talks about how life is about choices and establishes seven questions that people should ask themselves in order to be a better person or a better leader in their chosen field. Can you tell listeners why you wrote the book and what message you hope they gain from it? Well, it's just something I kind of learned during my career. That I mean, I see people, you, you meet a lot of people in football and otherwise, and it seems like in general people lack confidence, passion, stability, focus, strength, guidance, and, and self-improvement. And those are, the, those are the principles that the seven choices are built around. And I think everybody wants to, to have those things. That, that'd be the best way to live. And I think that's ultimately that's greatness. But not everybody knows how to gain those things in their life. And some people, their stomachs are growling, but they just don't know what they're hungry for. And for my football experiences and, and other experiences, but primarily football, there's so many great men and so many great things that you get to experience in the NFL. And I guess I kind of wanted to take these nuggets for this wisdom, uh, if you will, and put it out there to the masses. But I know the message is, is true. And the response has been very gratifying for us. Um, lots of lots of moms buying the book for their for their sons or their husbands. Lots of lots of men buying the book either for themselves or for their sons as a way to kind of touch on these important topics, things like identity and purpose and character and goals. Um, a non threatening way to sort of have these conversations. We interviewed, as you know, kind of a bunch of perennial all-pro players in the NFL, guys. I think everybody would agree they're great players, but everybody would also agree that these are great men and kind of see you know, that there's more to, to being successful in football than just having talent, just like is the case in life. You, know, you need a lot more than talent. And um, So it, it was a great project to work on. I got to do with my next-door neighbor in Minnesota, who's a very successful businessman a great friend of mine and a mentor of mine and uh you know we just kind of said we, we got to do whatever we can to get this out there and, and 
we did it. I'll tell you what's great about it when you read it is you realize so many kids and really often into you know, well into adult life, they really don't know what they want to do, who they want to be. And a lot of it is lack of structure and focus to ask these questions. And I found it really valuable, kind of put it out on paper. And you know, I've got a son who's 19 years of, of age, and I just sent it to him so he can start thinking about some of the same things. Yeah, it, it, it really is a framework for people so they can construct their own path. I mean, every, the questions are you have to answer for yourself. And if you don't, then if the default setting is, I guess, you just kind of let culture or society or other people build your path for you. And that's the path you're going to go on. And this is, this is about being intentional and making these choices. Well, Matt, as we turn to your football career, it's my understanding you didn't start out with a love for the game. Can you tell the fans about your first football experience? Yeah, it certainly wasn't real positive. I guess I went out for football in the fifth grade and second day of practice, we're out of the field at the rec center, and one of those uh, classic August thunderstorms was rolling in in Minnesota, and uh, you didn't need to be a meteorologist to know that something bad was coming. Dark sky, and the wind was picking up, and we just kept practicing, kept practicing, and then finally, as it was like raining sideways, and branches were snapping, the coach said, all right, you know, head to home. Well, everybody's parents had come to pick them up except mine. My, uh, we only had one car, and my mom had it at work, so I biked home a few blocks and just, uh, it was kind of a white knuckle ride and just made it and walked in the back door, literally soaked and, and scared and, and exhausted. And my dad looked at me and he said, what was your coach thinking? <laughs> and, uh, I told him, I said, I don't know, but I, tomorrow I'd like to go to soccer practice. <laughs> and then I did. And it turns out the guy that was coaching that team is a, is a great friend of the family nowadays and we joke about it all the time, but. Yeah, it was, uh, it just at that time in my life, it just wasn't for me, and I didn't pick it up again until the 10th grade. And when you did in 10th grade, what changed your perspective and made you realize you enjoyed playing the game? The thing I enjoyed most about football first was, uh, was the, the working out part, lifting weights. I mean, I was always a slow, weak kid, and I got into lifting weights, and I thought, okay, this is, you know, this is, this is helping me. This is like addressing, you know, weakness of mine. And so I loved it, and I really, I started working out really, really hard, and I was taking my diet seriously and trying to do all these things to get better, and it was working. And I wasn't a great player by any means, but I could see improvement, and that was encouraging and invigorating. And so I just, I just stuck with it. And even to this day, I mean, I still love, I love working out and lifting weights and, and kind of challenging myself like that. You challenge yourself physically, but really you're challenging yourself mentally. Um, you know, being in the gym day after day, grinding it out. The developmental toughness doing that, and I think that's good. It's, it's not just a physical workout, but it's mental as well, and I think that that kind of discipline uh, will serve me or does serve me well in, in all facets of my life. Well, obviously, the working out and feeling good had some impact because you chose to go ahead and play the game in college, but Harvard University is not exactly a hotbed for NFL players. So when you elected to attend college there, did you have any dreams at all to play professional football? No, I really didn't. I mean, I wasn't even going to play college football. And then uh, my coach said, well, there's some schools that are interested in uh, the service academies and Ivy Leagues and some B2 schools. I thought, well, I was a pretty good student. I thought if I could, if I could get an Ivy League or service academy, that'd be, that'd be a good reason to keep playing football. I I did enjoy it. I enjoyed the camaraderie and, and being part of the team. And I was still pretty raw. I didn't. I don't think I had like a natural love for the game, or at least for playing offensive line. But I, mean, I certainly grew to love it. Um, but yeah, it, it just kind of worked out. It was kind of a. I don't know if it, if it went through again a hundred times. I don't know if. I don't know if if, if any other time it would have worked out the way that it did. But I got accepted to Harvard, and I said, "Yeah, what the heck? Let's uh, let's let's give it a whirl." And obviously, I'm glad I did. Well, obviously, it evolved to where not only did you play well at Harvard, but you were drafted in the sixth round of the 98 draft by the Vikings. And, Matt, I'm curious, what is it like to return to play for the hometown team that you rooted for when you were growing up? Is that a good thing, or is there extra pressure on you to succeed as the local boy? There's definitely extra pressure, but, you know, I think that's kind of a pressure. That's a good pressure. Um, I can remember being... uh, being in training camp and, you know, so much crying myself to sleep because I'm thinking there's no way I'm going to be able to make this team and it'd be embarrassing to get cut. But at the same time, you have so many people, your, your support 
staff is all right there encouraging you, supporting you through the good times and, you know, early on in your career, a lot of the bad times, uh, the hard times. And I mean, that was awesome. And I was so fortunate to be drafted to that team at that time because they viewed me as a project. They didn't need me to come in and play right away. I got to learn from unbelievable veteran players. Uh, and I didn't have to play early. You know, had I, if I did, I probably wouldn't, I probably wouldn't have played real well. And in the NFL, you only get one or two shots to, to show if you can play or not. Um, after that, you know, two chances, they pretty much say, all right, well, you can't do it. Let's, let's move on to the next guy. And so it really was a blessing in so many ways. And, and it was just, uh, again, amazing how it, uh, how it worked out. It was the perfect fit for me at the time. Well, when you got to the NFL, you actually made the switch from tackle to center, I believe. Uh, had you played the center position before, and how hard was that transition? I, I never played the position before. Uh, it was hard, but I guess not hard because I had no bad habits. And so, I mean, I didn't know, I didn't know anything about it. But I just kept it real basic. I got to learn from Jeff Christie, who was really good at simplifying things. and was a great mentor and friend to me. Even though he knew that eventually they wanted me to take his job, um, he was just, he was an awesome guy. And I sort of just said, okay, you know, this is kind of cool. It was a new challenge for me, um, snapping the ball and obviously with the center making calls and sort of thrust into a, a leadership position on the line. It was something I kind of relished and, and just took head on. And when Jeff did leave, you know, Dante Culpepper became the starter as well. And we were both just kind of like, well, there's two guys that uh, everyone's saying, you know, what are they doing? Basically, a rookie quarterback on a rookie center. Yep. Uh, there's no way these guys can do it. We, we just kind of took that to heart. We said, well, let's see. Let's see if we can prove them wrong. You talk about leadership and learning things from Jeff Christie, but we always see the center making audibles and gestures at the line before the play. Can you tell us, Matt, exactly what are you communicating to the rest of your teammates when you do that? Just basically, just just so everybody sees things the same way. I mean, most of the time, probably everybody sees it like you do, but you're just saying, "Look, my opinion matters. Yours doesn't. Here's this guy's the Mike linebacker, and then everybody kind of bases their assignment off who the Mike is. It's not necessarily the actual Mike linebacker all the time, or whatever the the, the play calls for. Um, that's your call, but. It's just so everybody's on the same page, so it's not, you know, you're turning to one of those, well, I thought you were going to go here, and so I went here, and no, I thought you. Uh, just to just to try to clear things up and, and uh, you know, give yourself the best chance for success on, on a play. And when you do that, I know you're making the line calls for your fellow offensive linemen. Is the quarterback taking anything from you from what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, because the quarterback wants to know where we're going, and the next guy, maybe that running back has him, or maybe uh, anybody from that from that guy to the left, that's, that's a hot read. He's got to communicate that to the receivers. It, it, it's pretty complicated, but it's really not. You know, you kind of group things together. There's only so many ways a defense can attack you. Still 11 on 11. So, just, But communication is the biggest thing, so everybody's on the same page. And, you know, when, when everybody's on the same page, things things are pretty simple. It's uh, hot routes, you know, receivers break off, they, they throw, you catch, you gain first down. It kind of seems like, hey, this is pretty easy. When you're not communicating and everybody's not seeing things the same way, that's when bad things happen and you think, oh, my gosh, we're never going to get another first down again. So, <laughs> right. Uh, like a lot of things in life, it, it, comes down to, it just comes down to fundamentals and, and execution. There's not, a, there's not a magic formula, even though sometimes it might look like there is. Well, you were one of the rare centers in the league who could pull for a sweep. And I'm curious from your perspective, and you're a big guy too, why don't we see more centers in the NFL doing that these days? Well, it's hard to do. I mean, as I say that, it's hard to do nowadays because even everybody's another step faster. Um, and the field just getting so much smaller. I, I personally liked it. It fit my skill set well. I'm not a fast guy, but I think I'm pretty athletic in, in short distances and spaces and kind of getting able to navigate through the junk and get up to the second level. So, and you know, I got to learn watching Jeff do it. Um, so that was fun. And I've, I've been in all sorts of teams. That, that's more of a man team where players are blocking down and other guys are pulling. And I personally like that. I think it, I think it defines the lanes um, a little bit better than a, than a pure zone scheme. But, uh, you know, just, just nowadays, everybody's so big, so strong, and so fast. It's getting harder to put edges or put definite lanes on defenses. It's almost kind of now everyone's going to zone, and you're just you're, you're basically 
trying to cut guys on the backside and basically letting guys run themselves, running with your defensive lineman and out of the play. It's just, uh, it's just the way it is. The Vikings miss that big center in the middle, Matt Burke. They miss all the things he does. He is the anchor in the middle of the offensive line, helps out his quarterbacks, calls protections, blocks well for the pass, and he's as good as anybody getting out to the linebacker on running plays. Well, and how about this, pulling outside. out, Bill? Yeah, that, that's where he's the best at. And if you've noticed, that's the one thing that the Vikings haven't done this game, is run those perimeter runs to the outside because Matt Corey Withrow can't get out there. As good. He just can't do it. I mean, some guys can and are built for it, and some guys can't. You are able to bring, hopefully, a unique perspective because you happen to be one of only three players to play for Dennis Green, Mike Tice, and Brad Childers, and the others were Jim Klein, Saucer, and Brad Johnson. So from your perspective, what can you tell the fans about how each of these coaches were different and which one best fit your style of play? Well, they are so different. I mean, Denny was very hands-off. Um, I mean, Denny knew he and he was responsible for the atmosphere that we worked in. But Denny didn't get real involved with a lot of players on a personal level. Not to say he wasn't cold or unfriendly, but that was how he conducted business, and that was fine. Um, you know, Mike is bigger than life, and, and a former player, and in some ways, still still is a player. You know, kind of acts like it in some ways, and it was it was a lot of fun and. Like players are very blunt, very can be very in your face and very intense. And, and Brad Shaw is just kind of cross between the two. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for me, I, I don't know. I mean, I like to think that I can get along or work for anybody. And I think I can. But uh, I mean, Denny was great. He didn't say a lot to me, but when he did, um, it really meant something. And when I was a young player, that's what that's what I needed. I mean, even you're an NFL player, you're still striving for the approval of your coach or of your boss. I don't think that ever changes. If it does change, you're probably getting a little too, a little too big for your britches. And, uh, you know, Mike and I, I basically played for Mike for eight years. He says he's my dad. I'm pretty sure the, uh, the DNA test would show otherwise, but he certainly meant a lot to me and, and, uh, in my career. Kind of taught me how to be, uh, cause he was like me, um, long, long shot. He's a college quarterback. Came in to play tight end in the last 14 years. You know, did the dirty stuff, did the tough stuff. He he taught me how to be tough and and what it would take to, to play in the league for a long time. And certainly when he talked, I listened because I know that he he walked in those shoes. And then with Brad Childress, it was so interesting to see that West Coast offense, the pure West Coast, and sort of philosophically how it was installed and how it was supposed to be run. I think the pure, pure West Coast, I mean, it's always evolving. Um, we didn't run at a super high level um, when he was there. It just seemed like it was just never quite clicked for us uh, offensively when I was there. I know after I left, I mean, obviously, Brett Favre had one of the greatest seasons ever, um, you know, to run that system. But, yeah, I'd, I'd like to think that it took something from, from all those guys and, and made, me a, made me a better player and a better person. You talk about how tough the NFL is because people are getting bigger, quicker, and stronger. But you had the unenviable task of going against Pat and Kevin Williams in practice. Matt, what was that like? Yeah, there were no easy days in practice. Uh, but um, at the time, you don't really, you're not real grateful for it. But as you go, you, you are because um, you're getting great work and making each other better. Yeah, it's, it's kind of one of those things you think, oh, man, how am I going to do this today? Like, it's Wednesday. I'm still so sore from the game. How am I going to? Go against Pat and Kevin and, and, and be beat. And, you know, you have pride, especially in, in practice. You play just as hard as you do in a game because you don't want to get beat and then have to look at a guy in the locker room or have him, you know, occasionally players will talk smack. <laughs> you, you don't want to be that guy. Um, but I think it goes to you can always do more than you think you can, especially with your, your body. If your body feels bad, it can, it can, uh, the old saying, fatigue makes cowards of us all. Um, if you're not feeling great physically, that can affect you mentally. You have to disconnect the two sometimes. and You have to put out of your mind how you feel physically and just keep telling yourself, you know, this is, this is I feel great, today's going to be a great day. And when, when you're pushed, when you're forced to, you can, you can do a lot more than, than you think is possible. 
Well, one of the famous stories about you, Matt, was uh, you were a man of meager needs uh, and means uh, early on and lived a lot of your early Viking career in the basement of a duplex in the city. And the question I had for you was, was this a ploy to play on the symphonies of, of Viking management to get a more lucrative contract when negotiations <laughs> opened? <laughs> no, uh, at heart, I, I am a simple guy. And you know what? Again, I didn't think I'd be in the NFL very long, but the one thing I saw quickly was some guys get, I say this, ad adversity can knock you off your course, but I think sometimes success is just as dangerous. And you see too many guys come into the NFL and kind of start believing the hype and getting into the, the money and the fame. And I didn't want to be like that, nor really could I be, um, you know, being at home, my parents and my friends they would have put a stop to it. So I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to just gonna focus on football. Basically, that's it. If, if it's not good for my career, then I don't really want to take part in it. Um, so I did. I lived very simply. I had a couch and bed, a TV, and a dog. Um, and like one of those little college refrigerators, that was about it. Yeah. And I just, uh, I really kind of built my, my life my lifestyle around football. I'd be watching film or I'd be uh, training or eating rice. You know, I, mean, I even I opened a gym just so I, I was in the gym all the time. Um, it just, yeah, everything revolved around football. I was probably a little too much that way, but um, didn't know how long I'd play or how long it would last, but I said, you know, I got this opportunity and I just, I want to make the most of it when it's over. That's fine. I just want to make sure I can look back and say I, I gave it everything I got. It's my understanding that you have six kids, and my question to you is, when it gets a little noisy in the house, do you still descend to the basement? Oh, I mean, yeah, but now they take that over, too. It's pretty much anyway. Sometimes it's, sometimes I'm just relegated to the bathroom. You just find a bathroom and close the door and lock it. Right. You know, not many people leave you alone there. They think you're, you're doing something else. There's not a lot of peace and quiet in my life nowadays, which is okay. You know, back then, I guess it was... Um, Living selfishly didn't really hurt anybody, um, but nowadays that's not my deal. Like you said, I have six kids, and uh, and I'm here for them. Uh, and so uh, I'm called as a father, whatever they want to do. I guess you know I'm that that's what I'm supposed to do. If they want to wrestle, they want to play catch, they want to play Barbies, whatever. That's that's what I'm here for. Well, that's great to hear, and at the same time, we'll make sure we put the message out to Viking fans. If you've got a spare basement, let us know. We'll make sure Matt's aware of it. He may drop by. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should start like a basement group type thing, you know, kind of, uh, you know, I mean, I know a lot of people watch sports in their basement, but maybe more like a, like a like, let me come over and hang out in your basement with you. I'll tell you all this stuff you don't need. You know, we can get rid of a bunch of stuff and just break it down to the basics. I like it, the minimalist lifestyle. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, when you look back at your entire Viking career, what's the most memorable moment you look back on? Oh, man. There's so many. I mean, this may just happen every day. Like, every day I got to pull into Winter Park. and I mean, literally, every single day I was like, I can't believe this is my work. Um, it never got old for me. But probably, probably my best memory, the, the playoff game in Green Bay in O. And then after the O four season, so it's like January of O five. Right. Well, we you know, we were eight and eight and we lost twice to Green Bay on last day of field goals that year. We were going up to Green Bay and we were supposed to lose and, and we came on I mean we we beat them up pretty bad. Um and at the end of the game I think for like eight minutes we just ran the ball down the field, down their throats, and we came off the field with uh I think it was thirty seconds left. So we basically run out the entire last half of the fourth quarter. Um, that was great. I still remember giving a big belly bump to my O-line coach, Steve Loney. Just a <laughs> great moment. That's kind of how the O-line wants it. That's how you want to do it. Um, and for me, it was a tough year physically. I knew I'd been playing. I had a couple hernias. I mean, I could barely, I had really barely walked um, after a game. It was just so painful. And uh, it was kind of like, man, we, we gutted it out. We, we fought and clawed our way this season, finished 8-8, eight and eight and made the playoffs, and here we are in Lambeau Field winning a playoff game. It was pretty cool. Yeah, and it certainly was a, a memorable moment, and, you know, although he came to play for us later, we all remember Brett Favre throwing five interceptions to people in purple, so that wasn't so bad either. Yeah, that <laughs> helped. That it definitely helped. Well, after 11 seasons in Minnesota, you signed as a free agent to play in Baltimore with the Ravens for the 2009 season. Uh, Matt, how hard is it to leave the team so late in your career and start over again? 
it was hard because that's all I knew. But at the same time, I knew John Harbaugh was the guy I needed to play for. And we just kind of looked at it as a family, you know, this is a great adventure. Um, but it was just, I wasn't going to leave just to leave. But John, and I think, you know, history has proven me correct. John Harbaugh is a special guy, a special coach. And I just knew it was just a couple years left. I'd regret it if I didn't, if I didn't go play for that man. And I mean, even though we, even had we not won the Super Bowl, that was something I had to do. I just knew once I sat down with him, this is a guy uh, I want to play for. And, and you know, at that point too in my career, you, you get old, you get a little bit comfortable. I guess I kind of thought, well, this is going to be really hard. I mean, going to the Ravens, a team that's known for their defense, and and all these uh, veteran teams to go into this locker room and have to be the new guy and prove myself. I mean, that's that was really pushing myself, but I knew that that would make me the best player as well, um, the best player that I could be. So I really, I just, I, I, I had to do it. Matt, on behalf of the Harvard football family, we want to wish you the best of luck in Super Bowl 47 against the 49ers this weekend. One, two, three. Go, go Berkey! Go, go Davis! Go Niners! Niners. Woo! Well, I'll tell you, the gamble certainly paid off for you because in 2012, the Ravens would win Super Bowl 47 against San Francisco, and Matt, for all of the Minnesota fans who thirst for the first Super Bowl title, what was it like to win it all for you? Well, let me just say this. I mean, in 2009, you know, the Vikings almost won the Super Bowl. They should have, I think, and, uh, you know, part of me still thinks if I had I just <laughs> maybe a little arrogant, but it might have been there. I think we would have won the Super Bowl. Um, what's it like? It's undescribable. It's just, after so many years, I, just, I kind of couldn't believe that it was happening. It was almost it was like a storybook ending for me, and obviously you share that moment with your family, with your teammates. It's, that's what makes it special. I mean, people say, "Oh, you're the champion, you're the best." I mean, who cares? You know, nobody can remember who won the Super Bowl three years ago. So it's it's just temporary. It's it's fleeting. But to have that moment or those moments forever, to be able to look back on my football career basically with nothing but but joy. There's nothing. There's nothing in there. So I wish we had won. I wish we had won a Super Bowl. We did. I mean, I did. I, I was lucky enough to do it. There's, I can't. I can't complain about anything. Um, it's like it's all good when I think back. So that was cool. But when the Vikings do win the Super Bowl, the thing to me that I had no idea about and it was a great, pleasant surprise was the connection you feel with the fans. It really is like a hey. We did this. Like, can you believe it? And, I mean, the fans, the fans invest a lot into it as well. Because uh, I'm a fan. I know what it's like when your team loses. Sometimes it's worse being a fan than as a player because you don't have any control. Mm-hmm. That bond you feel, sharing that experience with the fans is second to none. Did you know going into the game, win or lose, that would be your last game? And if so, what was it like walking off the field knowing you wouldn't put the uniform on again? No, I didn't know. I didn't know. And I took a couple of weeks. I still didn't know after the game. Um, you know, I'd, I'd threatened to retire for, I guess, probably for five years. But after the season, you get a couple of weeks out, start to feel better, and you say, yeah, I can do it again. And I feel like I want to do it again. So I didn't know. Um, but at the end of the day, yeah, I decided I better not push my luck. I better get out. When they win a Super Bowl, it's a good way to end it. Uh, no doubt in 15 years in the NFL is a mark that very, very few people get to accomplish. And, you know, you do a lot of work outside of football and have for a long time. And I'm curious from your perspective, you've been really active in the Hike Foundation since you established it in uh, 2002. And I know your work focuses mainly on at-risk children and really highlights improving their reading skills. How did you get involved with that? And, and what are you hoping to do as you expand that program? For me, education is always the key. I'm most proud of in my life, or most—I think it's the most important thing I've accomplished. And 
when I was working with the Vikings, Community Tuesday, Brad Madsen sent me out to school, and I was hooked, man. It was it was fun. Kids are great. I love kids. I love the energy. And uh, I think trying to stress the importance of education, equip kids with tools they might need to, to make them better students, that's important stuff. So after a few years, my wife and I started the Hike Foundation and just wanted to get more strategic and make more of an impact with our efforts. And yeah, I think in 11 years, we, we raised over $2 million. Hundreds of thousands of kids were in our program. And hopefully we didn't just make a difference, but hopefully we changed some lives. And now that I'm done with football, I don't have the platform that I used to, but there's a lot of great programs out there. And there's a couple of things I'm working on that I think are, are very exciting and, and have the potential to definitely not just change lives, but, but change the way that, uh, kind of way we approach kids and, and supporting them in, in general. Yeah. Matt, you're not shy to express your opinions on key social and political issues of the day. And I know you've spoken out against uh, the people that supported Planned Parenthood and the education system and where it stands, and even reducing the risk involved in the contact sports like football. And I've heard your name whispered many times as a potential political candidate. Is there any thought in your future of a political path? I would never say never, um, just because the way that my life's gone, none of it's gone according to plan, thank God. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I, I don't even know what I'm going to be doing a year from now. Um, but uh, I know wh- whatever I'm going to do, whatever I'm going to put my time and my effort into, it's going to be something that I can do feeling like I can have a huge impact if, if I'm successful. That's just how I, I, I have to uh, I have to be passionate about what I'm doing. And uh, I'm just going to always swing for the fences. And, uh, you know, probably strike out more than I make contact with, but that's okay. Um, but, you know, we'll see if uh, if the situation's right. If, if I do feel like that's the best way for me to make a difference, then I'd, I'd probably well, do it. Well, just practice up on kissing babies. You've got six of them at home, so you can certainly work on that. <laughs> yeah, I can change diapers, too, if they want me to. Well, I, you've said on record before that you don't really want to be a coach, but I keep on hearing rumors of you coaching a five-year-old football team. And with that type of stellar coaching resume, Matt, are you angling for a 2015 NFL head coaching job? Well, I think, you know, the results aren't really speaking well for the Mighty Mites. We're, we're all in three right now, and we've gotten stopped pretty good. But, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, uh, to blame our general manager. I feel like the talent pool is not real deep. Um, you know, it's, it's always fun, five-year-old flag football, and uh, you go out there. These other coaches, I mean, they take a lot, of, a lot of pride. They get a lot of joy in beating me, my team. They feel like... Uh, you know, like they, they just like I was running. You know, the plays that we ran in the, in the Super Bowl, and they 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 were out schemed us and out touched us, and you know, it's it's five year old play football. There, there may be nothing better. I mean, they're really for to just kids outside the trying to get bogged down with all the worries of life. You know, kids are out there playing and just playing. They're in the moment. They they just have joy when they're running or throwing or catching. There's there's probably nothing better. Well, you know, the old saying is, you know, it's not whether you win or lose, it's how you play the game is really appropriate, especially at that age. However, if you're going to get off the 0 for 3 mark, you may want to send the kids into the basement for more of that film study that you had. Yeah, I would say it's not whether you win or lose, it's make sure we brought the snack. That's kind of our mantra mantra with the Mighty Mites. I remember that. It was the soda cans and the oranges. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, big time, big time. Well, Matt, the last part of our conversation today is simply a rapid-fire session where I'll give you one word, and we're looking for a one-word or sentence response from you. Are you ready to give us some quick thoughts on some of your former teammates? Let's do it. All right. Jim Kleinsaucer. Athletic freak. Brad Johnson. <laughs> OP. Ben Lieber. Ooh, cerebral. Adrian Peterson. Stud. Antoine Winfield. Woo! Um, Mighty Mouse. Dante Culpepper. Competitor. David Dixon. <laughs> Big Brother. Okay. Corey Chavis. <laughs> um, uh, Corey Chavis. Mm. Now keep 
in mind, Matt, we interviewed him just a week ago, so we can always go back to him and ask him the same thing about you. Okay. <laughs> um, intellectual. Okay. Mike Morris. <laughs> Meathead. <laughs> okay. And this one's from Matt Burke's perspective. The name of the prankster Viking teammate I would never turn my back on is... Oh, Mike Morris. And do you want to tell us why? Well, I could cite one, he had too much free time, so he's always doing something. Seeing him take people's trucks and, like, park them in really odd places. One time he took my locker outside. New Year's Eve, and he took my locker outside, <laughs> placed it out in the field, put a hose over the, the goalpost, and then he was holding, like, a press conference there, sitting in front of it, all my stuff, I mean, jock straps and everything. And he, I didn't know, this was, you know, 1998. This wasn't like the information age. I'm watching the news that night, and I see him holding court in front of my locker, him and Pete Versus, <laughs> on the practice field after I left for the day. And I'm thinking to myself, man, i got to get up at like 5 o'clock and go in and get all my stuff. I was just worried, you know, being a rookie, I was just worried I didn't want to be you know, like late for practice or this and that. You know, of course, luckily I showed up and, and Dennis Ryan, who's, I mean, he's all over it. He had already brought it all in and, and took care of it. But, I mean, yeah, the guy was, uh, there, there, there's just no line Mike wouldn't cross. I mean, physically, like he'd walk up behind you and smack you as hard as he could on the back of your neck. Like, not just give you a little love tap, but, I mean, <laughs> seriously, like it, would, it would hurt. I mean, he's like hit like a stinger down your shoulder. I was like, come on, Mike. I mean, he just kind of a, uh, he just kind of, I used to call him big, dumb, stupid. Um, but he just had a way of kind of wreaking havoc wherever he was. Yeah, well, it's good to have friends like that, isn't it, Matt? <laughs> you know what? You know, when, you, you, when you go to work, you got to have fun. And uh, nobody had more fun than Mike. You know, most of the time I enjoyed him unless I was the, unless I was the target of, of one of the pranks. I hear you. Well, before we let you go, Matt, much is made about your Harvard education, so I have to ask you, when you were growing up, did you ever use the excuse at school that the dog ate your homework? Uh, no, but I uh, I used a couple others. Uh, I had some doozies. You know, I, I mean, I hate to say, I think you know, my grandmother died about seven times. Um, <laughs> and she kept on hearing it on the news, right, and wondering what would happen? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. I, uh, Trust me, nobody was more shocked than I got into Harvard than my parents. They were like, they must have the wrong bad birth. They must mean somebody else. But <laughs> somehow it happened. Well, Matt, we appreciate you taking the time today to share your memories with Viking fans. And wanted to ask uh, if there were any closing thoughts you might have about your time with the Minnesota Vikings or their fans. You know what? There's, uh, I mean, there's, there's nothing better. I mean, literally, for me, we used to run home from church. We used to walk to church, and we'd, we'd run home to make sure we got in front of the TV in time to watch the Vikings. You know, football, and the Vikings especially, it's specifically visited in Minnesota. And no matter how big that town gets and how many sports teams they have, it's always going to be, always has been, at least since I've been there, it always will be a football town. And I really am looking forward to the day when the Vikings do win the Super Bowl. That will be one heck of a celebration and one that has been well earned. No doubt. Well, I want to remind our fans to get their copy of Matt Burke's new book, All Pro Wisdom, The Seven Choices That Lead to Greatness, on Amazon.com or at your local bookseller. And again, Matt, thanks for taking the time out of your schedule to join us today on VikeFans.com and to reconnect with your Minnesota fans. My pleasure. Thanks, Tom. Thank you.